grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, my sermon for today is about a rock, a rock that takes on hell, and understanding what that rock actually is, a rock that takes on hell. Well, Jesus had been with his disciples in the region of Galilee, and he had had a little bit of a stint last week. We talked about where he went to a more Gentile region called Tyre and Sidon, which is in today's um, area that we might say is Lebanon. But then he takes a trek a little more north in the land of Israel, and he goes to an area called Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi was a, a really a rather sacred site. It was probably populated in 332 to 37 BC, and it was a site of a Canaanite cult. And it was a fertility cult because in this site you had the beautiful Mount Hermon, which is snow-capped in this picture here. And when its waters melt, or when its snow melted, it actually melted and went through a cavern, a big cave, and it came out as a gorgeous spring that fed the primary river in the land of Israel, namely the Jordan River. It was one of the chief tributaries. So when this was first found as a site, they saw this beautiful flowing river coming through a cavern, dumping in a waterfall into a beautiful area of large waterfall and water named, in the end, Caesarea Philippi. But the cult that formed was they thought that there must be gods that worked here. It was so beautiful. So they called this area Baal Gad, the Lord of Good Fortune. Actually, they named it sort of after that. And also Baal Hermon, the Lord of Destruction. This is actually quoted in the Old Testament in both Joshua and in Judges. So it was a fertility cult. This thought that some god had to be worked to make such a beautiful area. Then came later on in time Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great conquered all of the region of Israel and the former region of Canaan, all the Mediterranean, as you know. And this area got renamed, and in came a new god. And they thought this area was so unique, and there was a shrine. Uh, this is a Christian shrine, or, or, or a godly shrine, really, made to the Trinitarian god, only about two miles away in, an, in a region called Dan. It was the northernmost part of the kingdom of Israel. Well, two miles away was a reference to the triune God. Two miles at Caesarea Philippi was a reference now to the Hellenistic, the Greek God, Pan. And you'll see little carvings. You can probably look in this photo. You'll see the cave to the left that the water flows through. Can you see that in that photo? And then in the rock, there are carvings where right now this is a historic photo. So in the carve-outs of the rock, you'll see a little, almost look like sanctuary windows, and in there they had shrines to the god Pan. And so this was considered, again, pagan central. Jesus walks his disciples here to ask them really a key question. Who do people say that I am in the central area of paganism? And of course, as we look around, this is what got ultimately built. On the left side was a temple that was built to Caesar Augustus by King Herod's brother, who was a king at the time um, over Israel, and uh, his brother was Philip, so it's called Caesarea Philippi. But he built a temple on the left to Caesar Augustus. The other things were all built for the god Pan. And here's disciples. Christ is asking, who do people say that I am? And of course, they throw out names. Well, some say... They think you're John the Baptist. In fact, Herod Antipas, Herod, the son of Herod the Great, he thought that uh, Herod Antipas probably thought that John the Baptist was reincarnated because he had him beheaded. He thought, well, maybe Jesus is this, this uh, John the Baptist come to life again after I had him beheaded. Another said, oh, I think you're Elijah. And then some said, you know, the prophet Jeremiah. And there's a lot in Jeremiah that speaks to really the work of Jesus Christ. But then Peter, Simon Peter, one of the first disciples called by our Lord, Simon Peter pipes up and says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Christ responds to him and says, this couldn't come from knowledge by human flesh. 
This was given to you by the Father. And he said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. That's Simon, son of Jonah. He said, Because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whoever binds things on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. Now I know Jesus Christ has had several names. He's been called the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Jesus really means Savior. Christ means King, the Anointed One. And as you probably know, in Old Testament times, before Christ, when a king was appointed and picked by God to be a new king of Israel, they brought oil and they anointed the oil over his head to pronounce him as king. So when Peter said, you are the Christ, he's saying, you are Lord, which is an Old Testament confession that says, you are God. You are Lord over all creation. You are the Christ, the anointed one, the king over the entire universe, the son of the living God. It was a beautiful confession that he made directly to Jesus, and then Jesus responded to him with a blessing. Peter, you are the rock, and on this rock I will build my church. But I'm going to digress for a moment. It sounds like Peter really did it up right here. You know, Christ gave him a, a kudos for really confessing him properly. But yet we reflect also on this Peter who is called out a little bit in this passage, and I'll try to explain what that rock statement means in a bit. But let's go forward a little bit and to this Peter, the rock. He was really more like you and I. A rock is strong. Peter also had his weaknesses, just like you and I do. Yes, he had a strong faith here as a witness to Christ. But boy, if we go ahead, he was, remember, on the Sea of Galilee. They had just fed the 5,000 Christ had and the disciples. And they were crossing the sea. And then a storm came up. And then Peter and the disciples thought they saw a ghost walking on the water who ended up being Christ. And Peter, as he sort of picks up Christ in the distance, says, well, if you really are Jesus Christ, tell me to get out of the boat and walk over toward you, and I will. And Christ, of course, says, come on over, Peter. So Peter gets out of the boat and he starts walking, and in this capture on this slide that I have in front of you, Peter begins to doubt he sees the wind pick up he sees a wave coming at him he was walking on water for a while when he had his eyes on jesus but when he had this little bit of doubt peter started sinking christ reached out his hand and pulled him up out of the water peter you would say of little faith and then later in the passion narrative as you know peter was in the cart yard where christ was in front of the high priest caiaphas and Christ was being tried for saying that he was the Son of God, called blasphemy, saying that you are God. And the rulers at the time, and Caiaphas the high priest was there, and as they were sort of ridiculing Christ, Peter had said earlier before this happened to Christ that, you know what, everyone else may deny you, not me. In fact, Lord, if you... If anyone tries to kill you, I mean, let them take me because I will never deny you. And of course, Christ knew that Peter, like all of us, are at heart a bit weak. And he says, you know, before a rooster crows a couple times, you're going to deny me. You're going to deny me three times. So Peter did. Peter heard this rooster crow, and he was pointed out by others, aren't you, with, aren't you one of the disciples of Christ? when he was in that courtyard, and he goes, oh, no, 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 I wasn't with him. I just looked like one of the disciples. And, of course, he denied him more than that. And so Peter, who was considered a rock here, was really like you and I. Individuals who have a faith in Christ, but we falter. Peter was really probably no stronger than any other disciples, yet he was called out to be a leader of the church. Peter was called up to be a key leader. Now, the Roman Catholic Church, when they looked at this passage where Christ says, Peter, you are, or I'm going to call you Peter, which by, why, by the way in Greek is Petrus, which means rock. And on this rock, which in Greek is Petra, sounds pretty, pretty similar, doesn't it? 
um, almost like synonyms, and yet in Greek, Christ for some reason did differentiate. He could have said, I'm going to call you Petrus, which means rock, which means Peter, and on you I'm going to build this church, but he said, on this rock I'm going to build the church. The Roman Catholic Church has interpreted this passage to mean that Peter was going to be the first pope, the first head of the entire Christian church. Now, he was indeed the spiritual leader of the church, so not to take that away from him. But in others, and in a commentary by Jeffrey Gibbs, more people tend to lean on this as theologians, that Christ had a dual meaning here, that although he was speaking directly to Peter, Peter was a representation of the 12 disciples. And on this confession of faith, on Peter saying, Christ, you are the rock, are you, excuse me, when Christ said, you are the rock, Peter had said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. The confession is considered the rock on which Christ is going to build his church. So not necessarily on Peter, the human being, as Pope, but on Peter's confession. You are the Christ, the Lord of the universe, son of the living God. And that will stand against the gates of hell. Now we know when we think of the gates of hell, as Christ talks to Peter and shares this analogy, that the gates of hell can't really fight against anything. They're gates. Gates really hold things in. So this is called a monotony. Um, a synecdote would be another name. It's when you have a phrase that stands for something else. For instance, in the business world, you commonly say, commonly say here come the suits into work. And what are we referring to? the executives or we might say Detroit won by three one runs in the last inning you didn't say the Detroit Tigers the baseball team but you infer that it's referring to the Detroit Tigers so when Christ says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the rock he's saying that it is interpreted by most theologians and by Dr. Jeffrey Gibbs who wrote a Concordia commentary in particular and others that Christ was saying that the forces of evil shall never prevail against the confession that Christ is the Son of God and Lord. So it's the rock is the confession of faith that can destroy all evil. It's the thing that we hold on to. And I heard one uh, chapel sermon when I was at uh, Concordia Seminary that was given by a psychologist who also was a an ordained pastor and had his doctorate in psychology and he said I think we should change the off the giving of the peace sharing the peace is commonly done in Lutheran churches where you give up and you say you know peace be with you he says I think we should say go to hell and of course when he said that at Concordia Seminary Chapel everybody was a little bit aghast what is he saying we said really what I'm getting at is that we should be able to take the confession that Christ is the son of the living God, that Jesus is the Christ, the king of the universe, our savior who died for our sins against all evil that's out there and go in the world and take on hell <laughs> to convert people, of course. And that was uh, a unique statement. But Christ said, on this confession, on this rock, I will build my church. The second promise he said is that the gates of hell will not prevail against it because evil cannot really in any way contain the fact that Christ is king, that Christ is our savior, that him alone is our gate, not to hell, but to eternal life. So it will prevail. And the third promise was that he said to, the, to Peter and then to all of his disciples who were listening in that he gave them what are called the keys to the kingdom. That is, if they deem that someone does not have a repentant heart, say they commit adultery and you approach them and they say, well, I'm going to keep on keeping on. I don't feel bad for what I just did. That's not having a repentant heart. And he said the apostles and pastors can turn the key to lock them out of forgiveness. And God honors that because God does not forgive an unrepentant heart. They also can open the door to forgiveness in other words when a pastor when a when a priest when the apostles forgave someone they forgave on behalf of christ as if god forgave that sinner themselves 
So that's called the office of the keys. So those are the three promises that were given to Peter. And Peter was really given those promises as a representation of all the disciples or the apostles sent forward. So we too, when we have moments where we're weak in faith, we should rely on the confession on the rock, that solid rock that can take on any evil in this world, that Jesus is my Savior from sin. My Savior for everything I've done. My Savior when I have weak faith. My Savior for everything. He is the rock. He is the one that should be in our heart that prevails against all evil. In the name of Jesus, amen.